Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Monday is a holiday. I think you got an email from the president's office today. Just as a reminder, Monday is a paid holiday, so everybody can have the day off. If you have projects you need to do, well, you know, you might need to do those, um, like me. <laughs> so welcome. Um, this is the first Still Healthy of the year, so make sure that you record this in my Cigna. I always like to say that. We don't take attendance or anything anymore, so you're responsible for recording that. But um, I have actually have a webinar to start that started five minutes ago, so I got to go hop on that. But uh, Kirsty is finishing her PhD in the history of science and medicine and technology from the University of Oklahoma. Go Sooners! Her focus covers social and technolo technological forms of knowledgeable and the brief rise of female authority in the medicine, medical, and scientific world during the 18th century. Kirsty, as you all know, is the director of our education and teaching. Center and she helps a lot of you I know with uh, recording and different things like that but um, I know you didn't come to listen to me so I'm going to let you talk listen to Kirsty welcome thank you can everyone hear me perfect thank you Tanya um, so like Tanya said my background's in history of science so my undergrad degree is in history of science from Stanford and then I went to University of Oklahoma to get a dual degree thanks guys um, and so my master's thesis looked at sort of 17th century ways of learning science and medicine that weren't sort of traditional university-based um, methods of learning. And then my PhD that I'm getting hopefully soon, um, it's looking at 18th century women in particular and the ways that they were able to access scientific and medical knowledge through cooking. So the reason that we are having this talk in part is because the library from the NLM has this fabulous exhibit on 19th century um, food and medicine in slaveholding America. And so even though my background's not in America, I thought I'd sort of set the stage in sort of early modern and the way that food ties into medical and scientific history. So we're going to have some fun today, and I'm, I know that I'm the ETDC director, and so I should be super high-tech. And I do have, you'll see at the top of all my slides, if you have a smartphone or a computer, you can type in that URL, and you're able to ask me anonymously questions. So if you don't want to raise your hand at any point, you can text in questions, and I will accept them. Um, I am going to go super high-tech and ask people to raise their hands as well. So... Just want to have you raise your hand. Do you know what a pancake is? I will pick on you if you don't raise your hand. So, <laughs> um, and have you ever eaten a pancake? Yep. And so I want you to think for a second about what a pancake is to you. And I know I'm biasing you because I have this lovely picture of pancakes already. And I'm sorry if you haven't eaten. Um, but when you think about a pancake, chances are you are thinking about sort of a specific experience. Maybe you make pancakes on Sundays with your family, or you had a grandparent who taught you how to make pancakes from scratch. Pancakes are also sort of really rich cultural um, ties because you have sort of fundraisers that are tied in with pancakes and sort of firemen's breakfasts. Um, my point is that food is sort of inextricably linked to our culture and society. Um, and so I'm going to do what historians tell you not to do and ask you to compare throughout this talk with your sort of 21st century surroundings. So saying that, um, just be careful. I know that sort of as a historian, I have to do this plug. Don't apply 21st century ideals to the past. So we're going to be looking at 16th, 17th, 18th century foods. Um, don't necessarily assume that there is sort of some kind of logical trajectory where progress is just continuing. Um, so food and outside influences, all of these impacts and factors come in and make sort of what a pancake is. So a 21st century pancake is very different from an 18th century pancake. So we're going to talk a little bit about ingredients. And I know this is not what you would make a pancake with. Um, so if we wanted to make pancakes right now, we would probably get in our car because hopefully nobody's got pancake ingredients just sitting around the school. Um, and we'd go to a grocery store. We have sort of massive options of grocery stores that we can pick from. And then 
we would sit there and think, well, what am I going to actually get? Am I vegan? Do I have any dietary concerns that's going to have me choose what kind of milk I'm using? Is it 2%? If the brand that I don't like is there, is there another kind of 2% milk that I can get? Are my eggs going to be organic? Are they going to be free range? Am I using whole wheat? Am I adding protein powder to your pancakes? That's how I eat mine. Um, but all of this is sort of decisions that we are able to make because we live in the 21st century. And so we, when we make a pancake, all of these decisions are factoring in, even if we're not consciously thinking about it. Um, in the 18th century, they don't have this mass access to ingredients. So this is sort of a modern version of what sort of 17th century farmlands would look like. Um, but what's important is when you're talking about access to ingredients, the 18th and 19th century see an unprecedented access. So from so our 21st century view, it's not very impressive. We have so many choices. Um, but for them, they're seeing an increase in ingredients and availability. Um, so just really briefly, I'm going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. Hopefully that's a term you recognize. Um, there's enclosure that's happening during this period in England. And what that means is that they're taking what was normally common lands and they're building fences and they're starting to really look at it from an uh, agricultural scientific point of view. They're looking into animal husbandry. Why is this important? In the long run, it lets them get more information about genetics. Um, but also they're able to sort of suddenly shift from, it's not really sudden, it's over time, but they're shifting from a living of subsistence um, to something where you suddenly are having surplus. So people are getting extra ingredients, they're making more than they need, and they're selling them. And so it's giving sort of a market economy. And so that's really more towards the 19th century. And so this is a really interesting shift period because you have this sort of fluctuations of what people are able to access. Or not. Okay, so Downton Abbey for people who follow the television show. Um, and just wanted to really talk quickly about social class in this period. So social class isn't a term that's used. Um, that comes towards the sort of end, middle, 19th century. Um, but you have social ranks in England, and that's really important because there's a really wide variety of social classes that people can fall into. So when you're looking at social ranks, it's sort of, historical prestige of your family as well as sort of how much money you have and there's old money and there's new money. And what's really interesting about this time, not only do we have the Industrial Revolution and you have all this surplus that's now people can buy, but you also have people who have more money. So you have sort of um, trade and guild classed people. Um, so people who are working and in sort of the tin industry, um, people who are getting um, professions, they all can start to afford things. So that's going to tie in later. Awesome. So the other thing that you have, and I'm going to sort of tie this in to public health, but you also have public infrastructure works during this time. And they're really interesting because there isn't sort of a national shift in trying to improve infrastructure at all. Um, so it's usually done by small communities. Maybe a, land, a lord or a lady decides that they're going to take an interest, and they build a canal, or they build an aqueduct, or they pave a road. And so you'll go into the town, and the road's paved, and then about halfway out of the town, it's not paved anymore. Um, so it's, it's kind of haphazard. It's, it's not particularly useful for the people. Um, but there is an improvement sort of in general in transportation. And what that means is ideas and food and ingredients are circulating faster, relative faster. You can't jump to, into the car and get to the grocery store. Um, and it's cobblestones, and you're still in horse-drawn carts. And the passage is rough. Um, but it's definitely improvement. And people are seeing that in a shift in what's available to them. And you're also seeing people traveling more, which means ideas are circulating more widely. So here's the queen. If you don't think, if you don't come away thinking that maybe I'm obsessed with pancakes, I do want you to come away knowing that British food is not sort of bland and horrible. 
Okay? So I know that's, that's sort of a trope that people believe, and part of it is actually propagated by historians, because they read these 18th century, 19th century cookery books, and it tells you to cook your vegetables for an hour in water. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with cooking, but sort of anyone hopefully should know that if you're putting asparagus into boiling water, it shouldn't be in there for an hour. It's going to turn into mush. Um, however, that doesn't take into account a sort of good understanding of science and heat and sort of the architecture that's available in the kitchen. So in fact, British food was perfectly cooked because there's been quite a few historians who've gone through and actually recreated in sort of the cooking situations that people lived in these sort of vegetable recipes. So speaking of sort of what people viewed sort of British history as, um, which I briefly mentioned social ranks. What's interesting is that the English context is pretty unique because throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century in England, the middling ranks, so sort of lower middle class, had access to meat and quite a lot of the main ingredients. Um, England's fairly stable at this point. You've got industrial trade. Um, and this is a picture, this is how British become known as beef eaters because they have access to beef, and you have these paintings, this is Hogarth's Gate, um, where the French, during this time, it's just precursor to the Napoleonic Wars, and there's a series of famines in France. And so what really is the difference, because the wealthy always are going to be wealthy, they will always somehow gain access to ingredients, but the middling and lower ranks in France, they're starving, and the British are enjoying their disgusting raw beef. All right, so you really can't talk about the British Empire without talking about slavery. Um, this is a pretty iconic image, and I don't want to sort of undercut the atrocities that were happening during this period to be able to make all of this happen. Um, so I do want to talk briefly about the difference between a 21st century context and an 18th century one, and part of that is because Today, we live in a world where you have mass media. You're able to, sort of at the touch of a button, figure out what's going on in the world. But it also means that we're accustomed to tuning it out. So if you go on Instagram, the algorithm is letting you continue to like things. And then it's only going to show you other pictures based on what you already like. And so unless you purposely go through and curate your Instagram by clicking on things that you don't like so that you continue to see a whole range, you're not going to see that. So the thing is, we can imagine a situation where you're not aware of what's going on in the world, or maybe you're not entirely aware of it. It's not the case in the 18th century. People's livelihoods are based on the slave trade. Um, they understand the sort of atrocities that are going on, and they're still continuing about their everyday lives. Oops. In fact, and this is one's a little blurry, I'm afraid, um, but they actually celebrated. Um, and so in the 18th century kitchen, to be able to talk about sort of what you're aware of, um, they actually have Wedgwood pottery at this point. And again, sort of a tie into the Industrial Revolution. You can sort of mass produce chinaware. Um, they have images of a lord and lady taking tea with a slave boy. Um, and Again, they are enjoying something that's actually the product of slavery in something that's celebrating it. So, not particularly a proud time. England does abolish slavery before America. So, <laughs> so returning now to the kitchen, um, the kitchen is this nexus of ideas where they're all coming in together. Right? So hopefully I've shown you that there is social and political um, sort of nexus and ideas, and they're all meeting. Sorry, I'm checking to make sure no one's put in any anonymous questions. Um, but let's get into the science and the medicine now, right? Because that's why you guys are here and what you're interested in. So briefly, how do I explain that people had access to scientific and medical ideas through the kitchen, right? So big cultural, social shifts, that's understandable. But scientific and medical ideas build upon theories. To be able to really understand it, you have to have access to the theories that are being talked about during that time. 
So this brings sort of in my master's thesis and looking at alternative ways other than universities, because obviously the cooks in the kitchen are not going to the university. Um, how are you going to be able to gain this information? So coffee houses, 17th century coffee houses, are uh, sort of the nexus of informal scientific, medical, philosophical debate. Um, they're a little bit more male, but they do have sort of a general access to the public. Um, also during this period, because I can't not mention it, you're going from the Renaissance diet of ale and wine. That's what you ate with every meal. The water quality is disgusting. Um, to tea and coffee. And so suddenly you're going from inebriated to highly caffeinated. Um, so I think you can understand the impact that has on people's thinking and sort of awareness of what's going on. Next is museums. This is a curiosity cabinet in Denmark. Um, and if anyone's seen Pride and Prejudice, they walk into this down this big estate and they're sort of given a tour of the estate and they're looking through all the art exhibits. Um, and obviously it wouldn't be given by the owner of the house because you only are able to go into the public houses when the Lord and Lady are away. Um, that's actually pretty common. So people would have these curiosity cabinets that they would create and maintain, and people who would visit their estate could actually be led through them. You also have public museums at the time, um, and there the museum curator actually just sort of walks you through and does an impromptu visit. So you talk about anatomy one day, you talk about natural history another day. Um, there's sort of no rhyme or reason in sort of what they're teaching you, but you are being taught sort of the cutting edge scientific ideas, and you're gaining an awareness of this sort of vast breadth of information out there. Um, these in particular are important because they were considered appropriate for women. Um, so you would take your sister, you would take your cousin, wife, um, and sort of polite ladies of society, um, this was considered an appropriate pastime for them. The other thing is public experiments. 18th century sees the rise of public experiments as entertainment. Um, they have some really terrible ideas, like they're going to sort of not ground two people, run an electric current through them, and then have them kiss, because that sounds fun. Um, electrocution, that's entertaining. Um, this one, he's not grounded, and they're running electric current through, and she's actually lifting um, lint with her hand. So it's a little bit less drastic. Um, but people are sort of walking by. They're seeing scientific medical ideas explained. You also have pamphlets at this time. Um, a lot of people are not literate, but they have a lot of images showing medical ideas, and they're not designed for the sort of high-level reader. Um, this is a picture by one of the painters in the Lunar Society. And I just sort of want to reinforce that these are sort of family-wide events. So talking about science and medicine is no longer a university-only thing. This is actually kind of horrible. There's a bird in a chamber, and they're about to turn it into a vacuum, and it's going to die. So that's why that poor child is crying. Um, again, sort of the idea of what they think is appropriate to bring around their family. And they're living in a time that you're sort of seeing death on the streets and things like that. They've survived plagues. Um, so it's, it's not shocking to them, but it is, for what they're seeing is not a bird dying. They're seeing the scientific um, ideas behind the vacuum. All right, so bringing it back to the kitchen, I want to talk briefly about technologies for us to be able to talk specifically about medicine. Um, and in particular, because this is of the Industrial Revolution, I want to talk about the significance of changing from a one-pot cooking to a multi-pan cookery system. All right. So in medieval times, you have a giant spit fire. You're roasting your meat. It's dripping down. You're catching the sort of questionably safe lard. And then you've got a giant vat of single-pot cooking, and you are cooking everything in it. So your vegetables, your dessert in a, like a pudding cloth, everything is being boiled in the same water in the same pot. So everything pretty much tastes the same. And if you're wealthy, the way that you show that you're wealthy is by buying as many expensive ingredients as possible and putting them all in the same food. So everything is salty and sugary and spicy. Like that's, that's how you know it's high class. Um, so 18th century... Again, thanks to the slave trade. Um, 
you have access to spices and sugar, and suddenly there's this realization, well, maybe we should have certain things taste different. Um, so there comes the age of people buying different kinds of pans, saucepans, frying pans, um, different kinds of pots. And suddenly, because you can afford them, people are buying kitchen instruments. Um, this means that people have to develop a different style of taste. Um, there's a different way of cooking them. It also gives them access to sort of understanding that when you had something that was spicy and sugary and sweet, you don't know if it's rotten. Like there is so many spices in there that you can't really tell. So suddenly things are being cooked different ways and maybe you're realizing that when I cooked it last time it tasted a lot better um, and I didn't get sick and this time it tasted a little off and the whole family was sick. So can't talk about changing cooking styles without talking about temperature. Um, and Women are gaining experience and authority in the kitchen because they're able to, through the experience that they're doing every day, figure out and learn things, all right? So a cookery book recipe is not something that you just follow by rote, all right? So you have to adapt it. Again, even though there is an unprecedented access to ingredients, it doesn't mean they're always available for you. So you have to be able to take a recipe and change it to what actually is in your kitchen or what's available in your market. Um, thermometers are invented during the 18th century and nobody ever thought to use them for food because you would kill people. Because they're only made of mercury and mercury poisoning is something that people are very much aware of and they bust. Like no one has figured out how to make a thermometer that does not explode. Um, so they never enter into the kitchen at this point. So we're going to talk about pies, and this is really where the medicine comes in. Um, so when I talk about pies, I'm thinking about savory pies, Yorkshire pies, pork pies. I know Americans like to think about sort of Thanksgiving and sweet pies. Um, so if you haven't had a pork pie, there is a layer of fat that surrounds the edge of the pie. And you can kind of see it here. This is actually all gelatinous fat. So what happens when you make an 18th century traditional English pie is you create your pie crust, you put all your ingredients in, you cook it, and then you pour butter back in. All right? So it seems like sort of an unusual amount of butter. I know the French are known for using butter, and the British definitely aren't. So what's happening here are two things. One, they do have puff pastry, um, but you're not using that sort of in your everyday life. That's for a pie that's going to be eaten the moment it's done cooking. They have these thick crust pies, and these are meant to last. They're meant to store the ingredients. They're meant to last for a journey. And so when we're talking about this, this pie is going into a horse-drawn carriage. It's probably in some kind of a box. It's not going to be fitted. Um, and it is being bounced and jostled over questionably paved roadways for five to nine hours. And that's lucky. That's if it's close. All right? So these pies have to last a really long time. They have to be durable. And a lot of them go and sit in the pantry for a week. And there is no refrigeration, none. Um, they develop these, the very wealthy, dig holes in their backyards into the hills, and they fill them with ice. And that's just for ices and jellies and syllabubs. It is not for storing food. That, that idea isn't present. Because why would you need to store food when Butter can do that for you. So the reason why they're pouring butter in, oh, I have questions. This is, oh, thank you. Yes, quality of bread and cake is an indicator of class with the idea of let them eat cake, especially at this point. I'm just going to go on a tangent because I can. Um, <laughs> Um, and I am going to sort of touch back on this anyway, so why not talk about it now? When you're looking at cake, cake actually is arising during this period because before you used to use yeast to make your cakes. And so in the 18th century, thanks in part to the fact that people are observing, they're looking, they're asking questions about why do I, when I change this ingredient or change out this one, what's happening? Um, they realize that eggs are great leaveners. 
and they start to make sort of more traditional cakes that we think of as cakes. Um, and so, yes, especially for the sort of fancier cakes, um, you have to have refined flour. Um, and, you know, it's not our kind of flour. It's more like our today's whole wheat flour because um, coarse flour for them is basically like ground up grains. Um, and you have lots and lots of eggs. And in this market of surplus, um, you're, you've got, you have to sell your eggs if you're just a regular farmhand because they'll fetch you more money. Um, so if you're making a cake with 16 eggs, it means you're fairly wealthy. All right. So Galen, Avicenna, and Hippocrates, they're the fathers of ancient Greek medicine. Um, and they have sort of a general understanding of medicine through humoral theory. Um, and I'm not going to go massively into that. It's sort of this idea that the human body is based on a series of balances, and they're tied in with astrology. And so sort of you have like hot or dry, um, cold or moist. I know I said it. Um, <laughs> And, and those, so women are cold and moist, men are hot and dry. And you tie in sort of the ways that you cure people with them. So if sunflowers and saffron, for example, they're yellow and they're considered very hot. And so they would help some, restore someone's heat and balance. Um, this has long since been sort of disproved. Um, you've got Vesalius's anatomy. You've got Harvey at this point looking at the circulation of blood. Um, but what's really important is during the plague, there's no good explanation for why one city is hit with the plague and everyone dies, and another city down the way that maybe has clearer air, is up higher in the mountain, everyone is fine. All right? So people turn back to this humoral theory to try and explain sort of public health. And so they have this notion of bad airs. It's sort of the very beginning of germ theory. And the idea is that you're actually sealing your pie with butter to stop the air getting in, because there's nothing in the meat that could possibly turn it bad. Um, they actually believe that if you take rotten meat and you soak it in milk and cinnamon, you can eat it again. Um, <laughs> so what they think is actually the reason why it's spoiling is air is getting in. All right, so this is rough picture of London and the Thames. Um, if you've been to London, you know the Thames is disgusting and you do not want to swim in it. And so sort of imagine 18th century, there is no regulation on sewage. People are throwing it out the tops of their windows. There are accounts of people coming into London and they're super excited. They've lived in Manchester, um, which is a growing urban town. Um, and they've been in the countryside and it smells relatively sweet. And they come to London, and there's just a stench of humans. And again, this is, for them, a rising, urban, growing population. Um, and so people are really concerned. And they suddenly start realizing that maybe health is tied into sort of like public health as well. So this is more 19th century. Here we have Faraday giving his card to the Thames, sort of the idea that maybe scientists should be involved in public health. And then also it ties into moral health. So there's also a concern that people are sort of drinking too much and there's debauchery and women are just giving birth on the street. This also ties in because there's a mass of trade to a little bit to Asian medicine and medical theory. Um, the British are really good at appropriating it in a way that's almost um, unrecognizable. Um, so this is the point where they're making curries that I don't, they're not curries, but they call them curry. Um, and so they're really appropriating these cultures and these ingredients without really gaining a full understanding of what they're taking. Um, but you do see, especially ginger, for example, and sort of more traditional Chinese remedies, you do see them making their way into British cookery books. Ginger is a big one. So we're going to talk about ketchup. Um, 18th century ketchup looks absolutely nothing like this. It's made with mushrooms or fish, and it's a little bit more like Worcestershire sauce. Um, but ketchup brings to mind the fact that preservation really is important. So you've got this idea of bad airs. You don't want sort of the bad germs 
today, germs, but sort of bad airs coming in and ruining your food. And you want to be able to create things and use ingredients past when it's time for them to be gone. And you want to be able to adapt your recipes. So how do you make it last longer? Um, ketchup's interesting because it's stolen um, from the East Indies and people are making their own versions even though they've never traveled that far. Um, and a lot of it's because sort of the second sons of British society went off and joined the Navy. It was a, a good way to sort of continue your family legacy. And so people, like women in particular, when you're in a kitchen, um, you know that you're not just cooking maybe for the household, you also maybe are cooking for that son or brother who is going to go on these really, really long ship voyages. Um, this ties into to scurvy and sort of grog and sort of people realizing that you need to be able to have access to sort of fresher ingredients. I say fresher because their solution is pickling, potting, and candying. So pickling is what we have today. It's that sort of salt brine that you put everything in. Potting is the butter. So you just fill everything with butter. And then you have candying, which a lot of British don't like. Um, it's adding sugar, but they feel like they can re-transform ingredients um, that they pickled and potted, but not ones that were candied. So this ties into alchemy, and I'm not going to go very much into Paracelsus and alchemy, um, but it just sort of goes to show how sort of all these cultural influences are coming to the fore. Um, alchemy is one of those scientific fields where women actually have a history of being really involved. They tend to be sort of um, the helpers and they help with the apparati long before sort of traditional hist history books recognize women as being involved in science. Um, and what's really nice about alchemy is even though it doesn't work, um, they create these vessels that can withstand heat, um, that can be hermetically sealed. So all of the utensils and sort of the scientific instruments that were used for alchemy end up making their way into the kitchen um, and are used for preserving and for medical use. Um, so I'm actually going to skip this one. I was going to talk about yeast and vitalism, but it ties into the cakes. Um, but sort of, again, that sort of idea of germ theory, von Liebig and his vitalism, the idea that maybe there are tiny little molecules that are making their way into things. And then Pasteur and Lister, of course, if we want to sort of continue the trajectory arc about germ theory, um, this is where sort of the cultivation of these ideas that people are circulating about this bad air sort of come to fruition. Of course, Lister is using it in antisepsis. Um, what's important, though, is these are sort of late 19th, uh, 19th century, um, but the ideas have already been circulating, so they don't have a full theory to explain these medical ideas, but they are, through observation, realizing it. So they've black boxed it a little bit, um, but they're still able to observe and sort of, they're gaining a working understanding of medicine, even if they don't have the full theory behind it. So we're going to bring it back to women, because right now I've sort of talked generally about the kitchen and sort of why is the 18th century a time where women are gaining authority and power in England? Why is it special? So we talked about the spit roast fires. Um, fires in England before this time, you see some architectural changes because in the Industrial Revolution and with the growing navy, wood is going towards the navy and building ships. And so they're starting to use coal, and coal is actually easier to contain. Um, and so you're changing from this massive fire pit that's spewing smoke. You can't see it very well. It's in a totally different building because it keeps burning down people's fancy houses. Um, and suddenly you've got chimneys being built and chimney design. Um, even, um, I can't remember. Um, one of our founding fathers, this is terrible, um, goes and studies a lot about chimney design. Rutherford does too. So why is fire important? Well, one, 
it uses taste. So you have all this smoke you can observe. It also changes how things are tasting. Coal has a little bit of a different taste than wood fires. Um, and people go to extreme lengths to get back these tastes. Again, talking about ingenuity and women coming up with interesting solutions. They start hanging their bacon really up high in the chimneys um, so it can get back some of the old smoky taste. And it starts like rusting in there, and they still eat it. Um, <laughs> Oops. But for women, it's important because if you look at what they're wearing, they would have caught fire. So women used to be kept out of certain things in the kitchen. They weren't able to deal with part of the cooking because there was a real concern that their sleeves and their dresses um, would actually catch fire and they would burn. And so what happens is when you have a controlled fire, you can actually have women taking charge and taking care of some of the more scientific aspects, some of the more sort of um, theory-based aspects of the kitchen. So they're able to observe what's happening. They're able to see that, for example, when you're cooking an ingredient in a pie, they shrink. And so where is that going? What's happening to these ingredients? And again, that room for bad airs to come through. All right. So this ties in to France, because at this time, you also have Diderot's Encyclopédie, and he's looking at taste. What does it mean to have good taste? How do we determine the senses? Um, what is it to see and smell and feel? And how does the body understand them? So the French philosophers are really fascinated by this. And they decide that cooking is an extension of taste. And so therefore, it's scientific, and only men can do it. Um, and so the sort of, in France, food becomes a sort of very male-only society. So women can sort of be an undercook. They can help scrub the pans. But they can't be the person in charge of deciding what a good tasting meal is. So this is one of sort of the images of a royal society. Again, it's sort of this male gathering. This is sort of more of what institutionalized learning looks at this point. So you have maps. You have scientific instruments. You've got maybe a deer with a tail. Um, and then actually what's cropped off is anatomy. And you've got alchemy. You also have gardening, because botany and gardening at this point is considered a scientific pursuit. Um, what's important is this is an all-male society. It's very exclusive. Um, and yet, we can point out how women are having access to almost all of this. So maybe not the scientific instruments, although they can go to the museums. But in the gardens, they're definitely understanding cultivation of plants. Um, they have access to some rudimentary greenhouses, too. They're very much aware about seasons and how seasons impact growth, because that impacts how they're going to be able to provide items in the kitchen. Um, scientific instruments, well, they understand about heat and how boiling water changes in different sized pans and pots through observation. And so women and, and sort of anatomy, and we'll go into that next, um, they're really gaining a thorough understanding of science and medicine, even though they have no access to these universities. So thanks in part, this is because of Newton and Francis Bacon. So the British context really takes the sort of experimentalism and deductive reasoning and highlights it. So if you've seen um, the Da Vinci Code, they go in and they look for the apple. And because there's this massive monument built in London for Isaac Newton, that's happening during the 18th century. So after he dies, he becomes even more famous and the British context, they really have to push that experience and experiments are more important for learning science and medicine than theory. Well, that means that women have a chance to be able to talk about their experience. And their experience actually means something. Um, this is also the period where the ability for women to learn is being discussed. It starts in the 18th century and again in the 19th century. And there's this concern that maybe these women's minds are too feeble to learn. They're not. And this is um, an Italian version of Newtonianism for the ladies. Um, and technically, it's a little bit like Newtonianism so simple that even a woman can understand it. 
which isn't great, but it is designed for female readership. So there is science and medical texts that are showing that women actually have a right to be able to express scientific and medical knowledge. Women also have a direct tie into medical knowledge at this period because there's a stronger history of women being charged of their family's medical welfare. Um, so this is sort of a woman being treated by physicians at the time they're probably about to apply leeches. I um, mean, you can see they've sort of got bone sores. This is also the rise of the surgeon compared to the doctorate of um, medicine. And then you also have women writing to each other. So what happens is this is a period where, thanks to Shakespeare, you start to question religion's role. The, you don't trust quacks or anything like that. Um, and so you could go to the physician or you can try home remedies. I mean, those are really your choices towards the end of the 18th century. Um, and women are sharing home remedies with one another. That's part of their correspondence in their sort of everyday lives. And then if it's really serious, then you go and see a physician. And surgeons also at this point are known for just cutting anything off just because. So you don't really see a surgeon unless you're, you're very, very concerned. Um, so this is also sort of showing the rich history of women being involved in their families. Healthcare, at this point in the 18th century, diet's something that people are really interested in. And they are measuring everything that goes in and everything that goes out. And I did not include a picture for you for that. Um, but part of that is actually their urine. They pee into these. Um, and, you know, there's some concerns if it looks like that color. Um, and so here it is. The woman's actually probably collected this, and she's gone and taken it to a physician to show. And so women are seeing sort of everything that's going in and going out of their families and keeping an eye on that as well. And that's part of their role as their housewife. Um, so women in power during this century, um, they're losing some of their traditional roles of power because before they were able to sort of meddle in voting and buy people's votes with beer. I mean, that's sort of how British elections were run. Um, and there's sort of a concern that this is maybe slightly corrupt. Um, and so people are sort of tamping down on elections. Women don't have as much political power in informal ways. And so some of the way that they gain this back is through cooking and making sure that their family is living according to their station, marrying according to their station. Well, how do you do that when you have guests over? You've got to show how well-to-do your family is. Um, which means serving ingredients that are off-season um, to show how fabulous you are. So you've got to be on top of pickling and potting and everything else. Yep. So this goes, a, this goes away in the 19th century. Um, 19th century women see sort of more stifling, and this is really the period where in the 18th century women have no land and property rights, but um, usually their families kind of take care of them, which isn't ideal and not a perfect solution. But in the 19th century, you have more working women and they still have no property rights. Um, and it becomes increasingly a problem. Um, and women are considered sort of no longer as intelligent. They don't have this sort of period for expression of medical and scientific knowledge. Now, I want to point out the people who do, uh, Marie Curie and uh, Marie Lavoisier, and Florence Nightingale, of course, are people from the 19th century that historians have recognized as um, women in medical and scientific fields in their own right. And actually, which is super exciting, um, when you look at the field of history of osteopathy, um, you actually have women from the very beginning. Um, and so as much as this is sort of like a downer, because in the 18th century, women had all this sort of informal ways of gaining knowledge and experience and authority and power through it, um, AT still sort of allows women to continue this tradition even in a period where in the 19th century women are having it taken away everywhere else. Um, so we should be proud. And then recipe books change during the 19th century and they go from something where you're adapting and it's this kind of collaborative effort with whatever's available and you're the ingenious cook 
um, to they start becoming standardized. So you have the impetus of measuring cups and spoons, and suddenly anybody can follow a recipe book, anyone can follow a recipe, and you don't require any scientific or medical thought or curiosity, you just follow the instructions. So I'm going to leave you with pies and I'll take questions, um, but sort of tying in sort of a really interesting way that food ties into medical history and scientific history and pies and pancakes being chief among that.